Hi, I'm Karen and I'm one of the pastors at Les Murdy Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us for this message. What you will experience is part of our regular service. And if you would like to join us for a full service, just type lbc.online.church into your web browser. Well, we are in week three of our current series, which we've called The Stuff of Life. Pinch that title from a great book by an Australian author called Carl Faze. If you want to have a read of that for yourself, you can get it at Coorong. And what I said that we're going to try and do over this series is actually try and draw ourselves a roadmap of sorts for navigating life in the middle, in the everyday. I'm not going to be, you know, we're not doing something that gives us GPS precise coordinates so that you can know this step, that step, not the other step. But we're looking to put some really big markers in along the way that are going to be boundaries, signposts, guidelines. And of course, we're a church, we follow Jesus, so we're looking to do that in the context of the Christian worldview. So, so far we've had the marker of love and the marker of forgiveness, and today we're going to um, talk about wisdom. Now, I reckon probably all of us can recognise wisdom when we see it. So someone does or says something it's easy enough to go, actually, you know what? That was really quite wise. But, but, but I wonder if, just sort of like as a cold call, if I said to you, uh, you know, what is wisdom? Uh, can you describe wisdom? That's, that's actually a little bit harder to do. So what I'm going to try and do today is describe what wisdom is and then suggest very briefly um, how we can go about getting it. Now, my husband's not here this morning. He's coming to the second service. Uh, he's a pilot, and uh, actually, for our very first date, uh, he, took, he flew me to Rottnest Island. But he, uh, he'd been so, he was 18, but he'd been so busy getting his student pilot's licence and then his private licence that he didn't have a driver's licence of a car. So his mother had to drive us to the airport so he could fly me to Rottnest, which was... I remember sitting on the bench seat between his mother and him and thinking, this is a little weird, anyway. Um, he did get his driver's licence in the end, which is good. Um, he he learnt how to fly, and uh, one of the things that he's done a lot of over the years is spent time teaching other people how to fly. And I've always been apprehensive when he said that he's off to do instrument flying practice. Now, instrument flying practice means that the pilot is effectively blinded to what is actually happening, or no, you're blinded as far as his eyes go, Cam's smiling there, to what you can see outside the plane. If I get this terribly wrong, I apologise, and you can tell Hayden to correct me <laughs> before the next service. Um, another pilot in the room. So they're blinded to what's happening on the outside, and it, it forces the pilot to use the instruments in front of them. So it's trying to simulate that, you know, you might get caught in a storm or a hazy situation or smoke, and you need to know how to keep this sucker straight and level and not land until you want to land. <laughs> um, and so there's really important instruments. The most important instrument, I'm told, is the artificial horizon. Good, I got a thumbs up. There you go. Um, artificial horizon, because if you can't see the horizon, you need to trust that little wobbly instrument on the panel there and believe that it's telling you where the horizon is. Other important ones, I believe, are the directional gyro. Another thumbs up. And I'm going to pick airspeed indicator. Yeah, Hayden was a bit like that about that one as well. Yeah, whatever. Okay. So the idea, as I say, is that the pilot learns to use the instruments, to trust the instruments. So if they're ever in a situation where they can't actually see the real horizon, uh, get disorientated by what they look at from the outside of the plane, they can actually fly safely. Now, I don't... I haven't tended to think about this much, being a person who spends most of her time on the ground, but seeing the horizon is very important. <laughs> it's a very important thing to keep us oriented. You might know the f uh, story of John F. Kennedy Jr. It was back in the late 90s. He flew uh, in a, on a beautiful, calm July evening, flew his plane calmly, directly out of the sky into the Atlantic Ocean. He had his wife and her sister on board, and they, they didn't survive that. As I say, it was a calm July evening, but it was very hazy, and Kennedy apparently uh, lost sight of the horizon, and he really quickly got disoriented. So no sense of panic, or he, th he thought he was flying straight and level in the sky, and he flew the plane into the ocean. Now, our inner ear structures that help us keep a sense of what, which way is up and down, you know, keeping me from not tipping over now, keeping you from not even falling over in your chairs, you know, helping you know what's right and left. They work really well on the ground, but they're not so useful when you get into the air. 
and in fact your inner ears and your brain can work against you in the air because they're busy trying to make sense of this new sensation that they've got. And the only way that you can say, stay safe in that context is to actually trust the instruments, not to rely on what your brain and your inner ear is trying to tell you. That's the only way to stay safe in that context. So that's the first thing that I want to say, or the overarching thing I want to say about wisdom. Wisdom is the thing that keeps you right way up when you've lost sight of the horizon. Wisdom is the thing that keeps you right way up when you are disoriented, okay, by what you see around you. So that's what wisdom is. Keeps you going in the right way even when everything is chaotic around you. But there's three features of wisdom that I want to bring uh, out to you. And I'm going to do the first one, kind of lumping, lumping these two things together. I want to say that wisdom is a discerning heart. So head and heart. If I were to ask you, you know, what you thought uh, wisdom was, some of you would, would probably describe it to me in terms of intellectual capacity. You know, so a wise person is a, a smart person, a rational person, a calm, um, good, good at problem solving, someone who knows a fair bit about life and the world. Others of you would say, no, 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 it's less to do with that and it's more to do with emotional intelligence. It's more to do with the ability to read the room and instinctively know uh, what's going on for someone and how to respond in that place. But in reality... Uh, wisdom requires, it does require some intelligence, some capacity, some head capacity, but it also very much requires that emotional uh, intelligence as well. That's why I like to say wisdom is a discerning heart. It's going to be one other thing I add, but start with that, a discerning heart. And I think one of the best stories that really capture this from the Old Testament is the story of King Solomon and the baby boy. It'll be familiar to some of you. Let me read it to you. One day two women, uh, one king three, sorry, if you're looking that up. One day two women came to King Solomon and one of them said, Your Majesty, this woman and I live in the same house. Not long ago my baby was born at home and three days later her baby was born. Nobody else was there with us. One night while we were all asleep, she rolled over on her baby and he died. Then while I was still asleep, she got up and took my son out of my bed. She put him in her bed, then she put her dead baby next to me. In the morning when I got up to feed my son, I saw that he was dead. But when I looked at him in the light, I knew he wasn't my son. No, the other woman shouted, he was your son. My baby is alive. The dead baby is yours, the first woman yelled back. Mine is alive. And they argued back and forth like this in front of Solomon until finally he said, OK, so both of you say this live baby is yours. Someone bring me a sword. A sword was brought and Solomon ordered, cut that baby in half. That, that way each of you can have a part of him. Please don't kill my son, the baby's mother screamed. Your majesty, please don't kill my son. I love him very much, but give him to her. Just don't kill him. The other woman shouted, go ahead and cut him in half, then neither of us will have a baby. And Solomon said, don't kill the baby. Then he pointed to the first woman and said, she is the real mother, give the baby to her. And everyone in Israel was amazed when they heard how Solomon had made his decision. They realised God had given him wisdom to judge fairly. It's a kind of a graphic story, isn't it, really? But I think that does show in a short little space that Solomon, at least at this stage in his life, he had a discerning heart. He knew, he knew a lot about life, but he also knew a lot about how human beings are wired and our psychology. So he knew that grief and jealousy was dictating one of the woman's actions. And he knew that grief but love <laughs> was dictating the other woman's actions. And he just needed to find out which one was who. And he was able to do that. Now, sadly, I have to have a little side note here. Uh, the story of Solom Solomon's life ends up being the story of a man who uh, totally loses track of the horizon. Um, and, uh, yeah, doesn't keep that wisdom. It doesn't choose to rely on those instruments of head and heart and the other one that I'm going to talk to you about now. But anyway, that's an aside. All right, so wisdom is a matter of the head and a matter of the heart. Wisdom is the ability to stay straight and level when everything's disorienting. But I also want to say it's a matter of skill. 
It's a matter of the hands. Wisdom is also the skill of living life well. Now, let me explain what I mean. In Exodus 31, uh, there's a story about a guy called Bezalel, and he was a master craftsman. He was apparently expert in anything you could think of that that is artisan type work, you know, artisan, I think that means like working with your hands. So, so with, with uh, silver and gold and bronze and wood and gemstone, gemstones and engraving, any artistic handiwork you could think of, he excelled at it. He was chosen by God to help build the tabernacle, which came in Israel's history before the temple. And it was the place where uh, God's presence was known to the people. Okay, so this was a big, big job that he was given to do. Now, when I was at Theo College, I didn't do Hebrew. I did Greek, but not Hebrew. So I only know this from reading what other people who did uh, do Hebrew can tell us. But Hebrew scholars say that the root of the Hebrew word for wisdom is also the root of the words to describe those working with their hand skills that Bezalel and the other artisans he had worked with. So the same root word for wisdom is the the root word for that creative, artistic skill aspect of life. I love that. Now, Carl Fay says in his book, The Stuff of Life, wisdom is about how we use our hands in life. Wisdom is about the relationships you and I build. Wisdom is about how we act when we are angry. And we are hurt when we are disappointed. Wisdom is the moral integrity we have, whether we are lazy or not. So that's what we mean when we say wisdom is a skill that you learn. It's a skill around how we build our life, how we build our relationships. It's the skill of crafting life well, of living life well. And we gain this skill, this hands part of wisdom, by the by handling our or through the way we handle our relationships and our emotions and our actions. Okay, so does that make some sense? Wisdom is the combined work of head. We do need to know some stuff about what's good and right and what works. You know, I tried that with my kid last time. Not so good. I'll try something different this time. There is some head component to wisdom. It's also a combination of heart. So that is to do with our feelings and emotions, but also where I would place that that intuition that some people have naturally and I think... If you don't have it naturally, it can be a hard thing to learn, but you can put yourself into that space where you get more of that, that intuitive feeling about um, what should actually happen in this circumstance. And sometimes that's right over this. I've told you I'm going to go off track now. Years and years ago, um, at a difficult time in uh, one of our children's lives, and they were very, very distressed because of some circumstances going on, and I actually bought them a packet of cigarettes and said, smoke one of these, which my head would be say, you just bought your kid a cigarette. He was already smoking at that stage. It wasn't a head smart thing to, but intuitively I knew that was going to get him calm and we'd get in the car and we'd get home and it was, that, that was actually the goal of that place. That's not an advert for buying your children cigarettes. I'm just trying to give you an example of... I, I think I acted wisely in that place, in that space. My head probably wouldn't have agreed... But my heart and probably my hands, my life skills, certainly did. Okay, so wisdom. Um, Where am I up to with that? It's a matter of relying on the instruments of head, heart and hands. And when we do that, you know what you can do and and say, even if, if life is confusing and difficult and disorienting. Wisdom is these tools of head, heart and hands can help us keep our eyes on the horizon, even when you can't clearly see it with your own eyes. Now, I'm sure you've had those experiences. I've just just described one there but I'm sure you've had experiences where overnight life has changed tragedy strikes in your family there's heartache there's unexpected things that are going on and you can literally get up one morning and go I got no idea what the heck to do here I don't know how to act I don't know how to be I don't know what to say what to do and it's overwhelming it's disorienting but I guess if we've got some wisdom built up in our bank we can actually Even though it looks ridiculous, we can remind ourselves of the things we know, like God is love and God is present. My family and friends still need me to be present and loving with them. And those sorts of things can actually become a little bit of a steadier as the horizon seems to be flicking all around. Okay, so wisdom is a matter of relying on the instrument of head, heart and hands. 
So how do we get it? How do we get it? How do we build up wisdom in ourselves? How do we get that wisdom that comes from knowing, that comes from feeling and comes from doing? Well, I think uh, we had the answer to that right at the beginning of the service. We showed, showed you an unconventional version of the story of the, of the wise man and the foolish man building their house on the rock and the sand. Um, and that's really where the answer lies, I think, to that how do you get wisdom. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew 7, 24, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. I think we get wisdom by knowing Jesus. We get wisdom through the words and the works and the ways of Jesus. We get wisdom when we know Jesus, what he said, what he did, uh, what he's like, what he's like now, even through the Holy Spirit. And if that's how we get wisdom, building our life on the foundation of Jesus, then we get that in turn by reading about Jesus, by listening to the stories about him and the stories that he told and then retelling them. You know, if you and I want to be wise people, then I reckon we need to spend a whole pile of our Bible reading time, particularly in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, that tell the story of Jesus' life, that record the story of his life. I know we read more than Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. I'm not saying don't read the rest of the Bible, but I reckon they, we almost need to have those books just going all the time. I'm trying to do that in my own Bible reading, just work, having, always having a gospel that I read um, while also reading other things. Some of the other traditions actually have got that figured out, haven't they? They have their Old Testament, their gospel and their New Testament readings, the Psalms, that sort of thing. Yeah. And of course, you might think, oh gosh, but you know, if I live a long life, if I'm going to read the Gospels on rotation, that could get a little bit wearing. Try reading them in different translations. We talked about that some weeks ago, the, the different translations and what, what they're particularly suited for. You can go online and, and get that sermon if you want to catch up with that. Or try, um, I think Josh put in the e-news on Friday, an online resource you can use. Go back and check that out if you want to find a creative online way of engaging with the gospel stories. Or, there's a whole pile of books. I've just grabbed some of my shelf just this morning. Uh, Simply Good News by Tom Wright, Endangered Gospel. You don't read those instead of the Bible, but find what people that you can trust have written about, particularly the Gospels, about Jesus, and read those things as well. Wisdom is built on the words, the works, and the ways of Jesus. And when we live our lives immersed in that, I think we do bank wisdom into our own being. So I encourage us all to read the stories that show these sorts of things about Jesus. And can you see how these things speak to head, heart and hand wisdom? Read the stories that show how Jesus always led every interaction with love. Doesn't mean he didn't call people up on difficult things and have the hard conversations, but he led with love. Read the stories about Jesus himself experiencing fatigue and disappointment and fear and see how he managed those things. Read the stories about how Jesus could read a room. Better than that, he could read a crowd. He had a lot of emotional intelligence. He could read a crowd and he would know whether the people uh, needed a feeding or they needed rest or they needed a soft word or a stern word or healing or forgiveness. He, he would know that. Read the stories and notice how Jesus invested time and energy in other people and never made a decision or took an action from a self-absorbed space. That's wisdom there. And then, of course, you've got to read the biggest story of all. <laughs> you've got to read the story about Jesus, who is God come to be with us, to defeat the sin that characterises human experience, the evil that characterises our experience, and to defeat the death that was the inevitable outcome of that sin, to liberate us to the lives that we are created for. That's a story worth reading. That's a foundation worth building on, I reckon. There's so much head, heart and hand wisdom in the words and the works and the ways of Jesus. And one of the simplest ways to get to know Jesus is reading the Bible. There's other ways, but that really is a, a classic. <laughs> so if that's the case, how do you go with that? How do you go with reading your Bible? Is that part of your week? Would you like it to be? 
Well, I'm going to suggest, actually, let's back up a little bit there too. Even if you find yourself listening at home or here this morning thinking, well, yeah, I'm, just, I'm not that sure about Jesus, I still would say to you, read particularly the Gospels, read the stories about Jesus. Any of us can do that, whether we've been believers for a long time or not even, uh, wouldn't even call ourselves believers or followers as, as yet. And there's three things we can do. Well, four really. The first is pick it up and read it. Pick it up and read it. Nothing's going to happen unless we pick it up and read it or listen to it or, or engage in the stories in some way. And then every time you read, try these three things. After you've read a passage, have a go at retelling it in your own words. If you're alone, you can do that out loud. That's okay. You can journal it. It's lovely to read the Bible with two or three other people and then you can take it in turns to retell it. So interesting hearing you know, how we've best just read the same story and here's the things that you know, Lexi might say, well, I what? When she retells it, she'll emphasise things. Glennis will emphasise another thing. And I'll be sitting there thinking, wow, when I read it, these are the things that stood out to me. So read it, retell it in your own words or listen to others doing it. Then identify, which one am I up to? So we won't count reading it. Retell it. Identify what stood out to you. So don't just go, that was nice or that was good or that was weird and walk away. <laughs> Identify what stood out to you. Maybe it was a weird thing that you want to mull on a little bit more. Identify what stood out to you. And then the third thing is decide what you are going to do about that. What action might you take? Is there something that you need to do? Is there someone that you could tell about what it is that just stood out to you? Is there some more research that you could do? Something you want to go and find out about? If you close the Bible and walk away without a sense of an action, often your day can be gone and you get to the end of it and you think, I thought I read something that struck me this morning. What was that? So three things. First of all, four things. Pick it up. Retell it in your own words. Identify what stood out to you and determine what action you're going to take because of that thing that stood out to you. Simple. You can do it by yourself. You can do it with small groups of other people. On another aircraft story, on the 15th of January in 2009, a US Airways flight that was carrying 155 people took off from LaGuardia Airport and within 100 seconds, so not even two minutes, the, into the flight, the plane flew into, well, I don't know which way around it was, Canadian geese ended up in the plane's engine and um, destroyed the engines of the plane within 100 seconds of, of getting into the air. There were, there were then 208 seconds before the plane was on the ground, so three and a half minutes after that time. And in that time, the pilot, whose name was Chelsea Sullenberger, he glided his incapacitated aircraft in a slow arc around to the Hudson River. And he landed the plane safely on the water and all 155 passengers and all the staff got out alive. He, he glided it to that place. Now, the air traffic controllers in that, that what, 208 seconds when he, his, his engines were gone, 208 seconds, they were in his ear telling him, uh, you, you could probably glide to this airport that was close by or this airport or there's a stretch of freeway that's there that we could probably clear the traffic, you can go there. So he's got all this in his ears, he's got chaos around him, um, anxiety in the airplane and he, he, there's a voice recording of the incident that has him saying very calmly, we can't do that. We're going to be in the Hudson River. And that's what he did. Later on in an interview, Sullenberger was asked how he managed to stay calm and make the best decision, even with all that turmoil, even with all the opinions from the air traffic controllers just doing their jobs, but in his ear. And he said this. He said, one way of looking at this might be that for 42 years, had he been a pilot, I've been making small, regular deposits in the bank of experience, education and training. On January 15th, the balance was sufficient that I could make a very large withdrawal. I'm praying for all of us, for myself, for you, for all of us, for wisdom of head, heart and hands so that all of us individually and as a community will know how to la navigate life well in the everyday, even if we actually physically lose sight of the horizon because of the turmoil and chaos around us. I'm praying for us all that we will have enough wisdom that it is sufficient when we need to call on it.